All right, so let's, uh, let's open in prayer. We're going to be in Mark chapter 5. Father God, thank you for the day. Um, thank you, Lord, for um, just showing off, Lord, and, and um, showing just a little bit of uh, your power and your majesty, Lord, even with the, the rain, the snow, and the craziness of this day. Um, Father, we thank you for it. We ask now that as we study your word, that, uh, Father God, you just allow the Spirit of God to minister to our hearts and to remind us that you are the God who's in the, on the throne, that you are sovereign, that you um, have control and allow um, just evil in our world for a purpose, and that is to glorify you um, even with that. And so, Father, we pray that tonight you'll open our hearts to what you have to teach us and uh, Father, I pray that uh, you also will just speak to us and remind us of your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're in Mark chapter 5, and uh, just kind of remind you of some things that took place in Mark chapter 4. Um, and, and the outline, of course, there's two parts of the outline. The servant gives his life in service. The servant, of course, is Jesus, and that's the first 10 chapters of this. And then uh, this, the, the last part, is the servant give his life in sacrifice, and that's the last uh, five chapters of, of Mark. Um, we've looked at uh, section one, where the servants work. Uh, that's the first three chapters. And then uh, the servants' words are, are in the section, section two, and that's chapter four and five. Um, so when we looked at chapter four, we looked at the fact that his words were exact in his purpose. Um, and as we looked at them, we realized that he gave us some parables, the parable of the sower and the seed, uh, the parable of uh, the light under the basket, and uh, then he talked about the parable of the growing seed and the mustard seed. But then at the end of chapter 4 is where I want us to draw our attention as we start. Jesus is leaving after doing all this teaching, and he gets in a boat with his disciples, and they began to uh, sail over to the other side of the lake. Jesus is tired, so Jesus goes to the front of the boat, and he falls asleep. Um, and the boat begins to rock, and the winds begin to, to blow, and there's a storm that comes up. And what does Jesus do? He stays asleep, right? He stays asleep. And so the disciples are afraid, and they wake Jesus up, and what does Jesus do then? He calms. Peace be still, and he calms the storm. So, as they get to the other side, how do you think, and, and I want us to look at um, the last verse in there where it says, um, uh, verse 41 says, uh, And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So how do you think the disciples are feeling at this point? It's a good question because it's a how and, and there's no wrong answer. So, Okay. Absolutely stunned. What else do you think they're feeling? Yeah, he's not ordinary. Okay. What else? Maybe a little fearful. Okay. I mean, who wouldn't be, right? Okay, so we're in this mood, a, a little fearful, maybe a little stunned, maybe in awe, um, maybe wondering what is going on. Okay, so we, we have all these feelings going on, and then we come to chapter 5. Chapter 5, he begins to deal in chapter 5 with uh, demons, disease, and death. So look at verse 1. First thing we're going to see, he's going to triumph over these demons, and there's going to be this confrontation here in verse 1. He says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadareans. So the country of the Gadareans was on the eastern shore of, um, uh, of the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's opposite of Mag Magdalia. Um, it's five miles up from the point where the Jordan River flows into the Sea of, sea of Galilee. So if you're familiar with the Sea of Galilee in Israel, um, you know that 
coming out of the mountains, the, the, uh, the Jordan River makes its way down, and then there's the Sea of Galilee. And then there, after that, it pours out into another part of the Jordan River, and then at the end, at the bottom of it, is the Dead Sea, where it goes and, and it dies, basically. Um, and so uh, this is five miles north of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is say, saying he has to go there. So it's been a wild and stormy night, obviously, for the disciples, right? Um, now it's going to be a wild and stormy morning. Jesus has dealt with the bad weather, but he's about to deal with blatant wick- wickedness. He's about to deal with blatant wickedness. Now, if you're taking notes, here, here, here's a, a, principle, a principle of truth, okay? A principle of truth. The devil never rests. The devil never rests. And he never will. And all we have to do really is just turn on the news, look at what's going on in in not just our country, but other countries. Um, I was reading an article today about Israel. And Israel, since uh, Ramadan Ramadan started, which was like last week, they have had nothing but violence in their city streets. Um, And it's getting worse every night. Um, So... What do we see? What do we see? What do demons cause? They cause anger. They cause bitterness. They cause hatred. They cause, um, they cause violence. They cause um, you know, drunkenness, uh, drugs. They call, cause sexual sins. I mean, everything that Paul lists in Romans chapter 1 um, is caused by him. Okay? Um, and what does our nation need today as we see all this? And not just our nation, but our world. But we need a big dose of Jesus. Um, we need a big dose of Jesus. So we're going to look at demons, disease, and, and death, uh, the three great terrors of mankind. He's, he's going to uh, deliver in turn to these demons to a man, a woman, and a child. So he's going to deal with all three of these. Um, and what we're going to see in here is that we have a great Savior who loves us so much. Okay? So verse 1, Jesus is going to the Gadareans, um, to the country of the Gadareans. Verse 2 and 3. When he came out of the boat, here's Mark's favorite word that he uses often in, this, in his, in his um, gospel. Immediately, as soon as he got out of the boat, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. So <clears throat> this city, uh, this place that he's going to, as he would go get, get closer down, the walls would kind of come in on him. Um, and there would be like a, a steepness in there. And, and in this area would have been some tombs. And out of this area, this man came. Um, and this man would have been the terror of the town. Uh, he, Satan had tried to just drown the Lord in chapter 4. Now he's going to use this demonic man um, against him. And what the disciples thought when this fearful savage appeared, we're not told. But remember, they've just come from seeing him calm the storm, and now all of a sudden this man comes out of the tombs. Okay, so if they were frightened, if they were in, in fear, their fear is even ramping up even more. Um, and so this demented man is now here, um, and he is full of passion and rage. Nor was this man victimized. He was not a victim, uh, a one of delusion. He was not someone who was criminally insane, nor was he just an ordinary demonic man. Um, this man was possessed not just by an evil spirit, but we're going to learn la- later on. He's possessed by many evil spirits, all right? Um, so this guy, if you will, would, be, would have been Satan's prize, prize exhibit. This guy has is, is been tormented. He has been driven by a vast number of evil spirits, and he is uh, placed in, 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 in uh, far away, away from the town. Uh, the people uh, in that vicinity, in that area, would have uh, protected themselves from this fearful man, protected their children from this fearful man. Um, they had tried everything. According to verse 3, it looks like they had tried to chain him. He had broken those chains in, chains in the pieces. They had driven him out. Uh, He lived with the dead, okay? Um, So he's poor, he's lost, he's lonely. Here's this man who who is hated, he has been shunned, and he is feared 
by everyone. Now, we don't know how he got into this condition. Um, demon possession is a mysterious but a real condition. Um, any missionary in a third world country will tell you that demon possession is real. Okay? Um, idolatry and demon possessions are often twins. Tampering with the occult, getting involved with drugs, flagrant immorality um, are all means whereby evil spirits get hold of people, invade the bodies, and control their souls. Or you can just watch the evening news, and that'll do the same thing to you. Jesus saw beyond the terrible wreckage of this demented man, and what he saw was a soul that needed and had conflict and confusion. And inside this man, inside this demonic man, was a man who was desperate, who was desperate. And a lot of times in life we see someone and we think, man, that person's evil. Man, that person's mean. Man, that person's cruel. That person's hateful. That person's this. That person's that. But underneath all of that is a desperate, confused person who needs Jesus Christ. Um, and so we need to keep that in mind. Verse 4. Because he had often, ba- had often been bound with shackles and chains... And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. All right? So the ordinary, even the harshest restraints imposed by society at that time, he was able to break free from all of them. Um, He had demonic strength. No prison could hold him. Nowadays, uh, nowadays they would take him and try psychology on him. Psychology does not work against someone who is demon-possessed. Um, and cannot cure it. So the man is left where? In a graveyard. He's left in tombs with dead people. He's a dead person uh, spiritually, uh, but he's in this graveyard. And sensible people leave him alone. Verse 5. And always night and day he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. So you get the picture. I mean, he's in, he's in this tombstone, uh, in this graveyard, and he's howling, and he's making weird noises, and, he, um, and, and the people are hearing him. But long ago, his, his um, cries had reached the heart of God and touched the heart of Jesus. And just as Jesus says about the woman at the well, he said, I must go through Samaria. Jesus is the same thing here. Guys, we need to go to, the, go to the Gadarenes. There's somebody there I need to meet. Somebody there I need you to see. Um, and so the second thing we see is in verse 6 through 8, and that's the contradiction. When he, uh, when he, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. All right, so this guy, we don't know how long he's been there. Okay, we don't have any idea. But when you think and you see a picture of this guy in your mind, what do you see? Say again. Scary. Why? Okay. So, okay. So he's scary. He what? Like a horror movie kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. What else? What else do you think? Hide the children. Hide the women and children. Right? Shrek. Shrek's coming to town. So, smelly. Okay, he's living with the dead, right? He's got to be smelly. Okay. Anything else? Emptiness in his eyes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
So as I was thinking about this and reading over this and looking over it again today, I was thinking about Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway, right? When he first lands, he's strong, you know, he, he looks good, but then there's a break in the action and it says, four years later! And we really, we went to the, to the uh, theater to watch it, Lisa and I did, and, and uh, there was like, about this many people in the theater and it said that on the screen and one lady was like four years later <laughs> real loud and we were laughing, started laughing. Um, yeah and when you look at him four years later what I mean he's got long hair he's got you know he's dirty you get the picture of he's smelly uh, long fingernails I mean he lost a lot of weight scrawny and but he's scary looking and you're like Ugh, right we're not told how long this man had been like this, but that's the picture that we get here with him. Unwashed um, as he approaches them, um, unwashed and either naked or just wearing rags, uh, filthy, dirty, probably smelly. And, and if anybody ever came that way, what would he do? He would chase them away or fall on them violently and do them harm. And so when Jesus comes, what's he do? Verse 6. What's he do? He ran and worshipped him. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? He ran down, he fell down, and he worshipped him. But then look at verse 7. He cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. So is that the man speaking? That was a demon speaking, right? The voice of evil coming out, and it, it's recognizable. It confesses Jesus to be the Son of God. This is not the first time a demon has done this. Um, and immediately, though, it not only calls him Christ, the Son of God, but then what does it do? He calls him the Son of the Most High, but what else does he do? He slanders him. He slanders him, and he accuses him. Jesus, you are a tormentor. Okay? Right? Do we see the world doing that today? Yeah. God, it's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. You know, you're good, God, but you do this. Okay? Here, here, here it is, and he's tormenting, he's accusing him. Throughout the gospel, we see consistently demons recognize Jesus as the Son of God. They confess him as the Son of God but they also blame him, right? Um, and, and, and Jesus does what? He always commands them to be silent. He, he refuses to let them uh, witness, accept witness from them. Um, and to this day, there are evil spirits who masquerade as the Holy Spirit, and they try to con but they cannot confess that Jesus is, has come in the flesh, and that he's Lord. Um, and we see it all over the place. And so the demons that inhabited the body of this wretched man pays tribute to the deity of Jesus Christ. They also knew him by name. He was Jesus, and they addressed him as that. Um, although they hated and feared that name, they knew who he was, um, and they knew who he is. Um, Jesus said to his disciples, you call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. In other words, there's a proper form of address. And here we see him properly addressed, not by the disciples, but by the demons that are in this man. Look at verse 8 now. All right? <clears throat> and perhaps this is how the, the demons who were tormenting this man knew who had arrived on the scene. But he says, for he said to him, come out of the man, and then he calls him what? An unclean spirit all right so the demons are terrified right and so everything kind of pauses here for a moment uh, because they know who he is and they know what power that he has many of the problems we have in our own lives is we either don't know who he is or don't believe in the power that he has and and these demons they know the power that he has to set people free and set them free from this. And notice what does he tell this, these, this, man, this unclean spirit? What does he tell him? Come out of there, 
right? Well, not yet, not yet. He doesn't ask that. In verse 8, he says, come out of that man, right? Come out of that man. <clears throat> they, they had the claim on this man's body. They had a claim on this man's soul. They had fastened upon him. They were there. They, they had no legitimate claim to that house, though. They had no legitimate claim to that house. Um, and they knew it, and Jesus knew it. They could scoff at the poor attempts of the local people to tame him, but they couldn't scoff at Jesus. They knew that Jesus had the power to do that. Because why? Because the demons or Satan himself, the strong men armed, might be able to keep stolen goods. But when Jesus comes along, he's stronger than they are. Um, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Okay? Um, and so that's what we need to remember at all time, that demons and Satan himself are no match for Jesus. So verse 9, we see a confession. So we ask him, RJ, what is your name? <laughs> and he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. All right, so... We've all seen the movies where people have different personalities, and we've seen the TV shows with people that have di different personalities and stuff, and we, we wonder how that can be. But it's because there's more than one demon in that person. Um, and here we see the, the, the Bible who would give us this spiritual diagnosis, and it would say, you know what, the problem with all of that is demon possession, and it's real. Um, and in the case of this, this man who was possessed, he was possessed by a legion of demons, literally thousands of them. And so the man's answer to the, the Lord's question as to his name and identity is, he says, legion, for we are many. Um, and so the Lord's presence had already helped him to unravel some of the confusion. Um, it was the man himself who said legion, and it was probably the demon who came alongside and said, we are many. Uh, verse 10 through 12, we see the consternation. In verse 10, he says, And he begged him earnest, also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. All right, so who's speaking in that verse? The man or the demons? The demons, yeah. Um, and, and so evidently there is a spokesman for the demons. Um, and if so, then it suggests that this man had grown accustomed to the demons being in him and, and controlling him. Um, and we wonder, why does he say not to send him out of that country? What do you mean by that? Well, if you go back to our study in Daniel, we learn from Daniel that there are fallen angels that rule over fallen man in different parts of the country, in different parts of the regions of the world. Satan's agent in the spirit world would rule over designated territories. So we, re we read in there where Gabriel would come down and talk to Daniel and said, and he can't, it, took him, it took him three weeks to get there because he was fighting against the prince of Persia. And as he was going back, he was going to fight against the prince of Greece. He wasn't talking about real people. He was talking about satanic, demonic beings that he was fighting with. And those same beings are still out there today, and they're still controlling different parts of the world. And we can get into all that spiritual stuff and everything else that's out there, but just know that they are real, and they are really controlling things. Paul deals with that in the whole thing when he talks about the, that there are powers and principi principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. W what's he talking about? He's talking about demons that are controlling or behind the people that are controlling things in our world. And so there are, there are spiritual beings uh, behind and things. Lisa and I were talking about things going on in our, in, in our nation and saying, you know, I don't know if anybody could find, she said something about, uh, I don't know if anybody could get saved in the White House with all this spiritual demonic stuff flying around. Anything's possible with God. Um, and so we continue to pray. Um, but with everything going on in our country, it seems to be that there are more and more demonic activity going on in our country um, today. Um, and so 
Why is that? Well, because we have basically kicked God out of our country. Uh, we've kicked him out of our schools. We've kicked him out of our country. And we said, God, we don't want to do that. We can do this on our own. And what we have is a nice way of saying we have a mess. Um, and it's because of our own doing that we have done over the years. Um, and so we are a mess. Um, and this man was a mess um, because uh, these people, these demons were in him. Um, but for some reason, and, and we're, not, we're not told, but obviously this, if this is the area that they have been assigned to by the devil, uh, he wants them to control that area. Um, and for some reason, they don't want to be kicked out of that area. Um, we don't know if they were, you know, were they terrified uh, of Satan um, and, or, or more than they were of what Jesus could do to them. I, I don't know. Or maybe they were, just, they were just consumed with the fact that maybe Jesus could send them, send them to, to, to hell and be done with them right then and there. But they, were, they, they wanted something other than, than that. Um, verse 11 and 12 is interesting. He says, Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter enter them. All right, I am going to abstain from doing any deviled ham jokes, Ed. I'll leave that up to you. Um, <laughs> but uh, the demons who spoke, uh, adding their vo- legion of voices to this of the demonic and the demons fearing to be again disembodied, craved permission to go into the pigs into the swine um, rather than to be left totally embodied um, and so they ask um, which I, you know you find interesting because we think of demons and Satan as being powerful and all powerful and everything else but they're not Jesus is more powerful than they are and they have to ask permission to do anything remember the story of Job God goes to, Satan comes in and God says, hey, have you considered my servant Job? And and basically he's saying, look, you can go and do this to him, but you can't take his life. So he's nothing more than, as someone has said, a dog on a chain. Um, When you have a dog on a chain, he's not going to be able to get free. You're in control of him. Um, And so God is in control of him, and he's not allowed to get free. Um, So uh, they, v- verse 13, the condemnation. The demons are swiftly disembodied after all. Uh, and look at verse 13. At once, Jesus gives them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about how many? 2,000. 2,000 swine. 2,000 pigs. That's a big herd. Okay? And they all ran, the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So the demons are swiftly disembodied. Uh, The swine preferred death to demon possession. In the Roman army, a legion would have 6,000 soldiers in it, about about 6,000 soldiers. So if we we have 2,000 pigs and and 6,000 soldiers, 6,000 demons... That's three demons per pig, if my math is right. If it's not, we'll ask Fred to do it. Uh, Okay, they're good. But that was enough. That was more than enough for all 2,000 of them to run down and headlong into into the river, into the lake, and drown. Look at the consultation in verse 14 through 17. So those who fed the swine fled... Um, and they told it in the city, in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. So, why is this significant? Well, first of all, you have to understand the Mosaic Law. Under the Mosaic Law, swine was considered to be an unclean animal. So an unclean animal, Jewish people raising swine, would have been illegal. Okay? Okay. Um, And it would have been definitely unclean. So the Lord has been criticized here for destroying other people's property. Did he? (laughs) 
Okay. Okay. Then they right. All those pigs are gone. He's out. Right. Black market. <laughs> Black market bacon. That's right. Uh huh. Even more important though is this. Did Jesus destroy somebody else's property? No. Mm, maybe. But whose pigs were those to begin with? It was all his, right? Everything is his. He's the great creator. So it's all his. Um, and so as the and he's the rightful king. He's the rightful king of the country. So he was just claiming what was his and and in order to claim it, what did he have to do? He had to clean it. He has to clean up his kingdom. What does God need to do? He needs to make his kingdom fit to be lived in. According to the Mosaic law, swine were unclean animals. So he had to get rid of those. And on two other occasions, Jesus would go into the temple itself and take a whip and chase out the people out of there. Why? To make it clean to make it clean. And we talked about this Sunday, you know, this is, this is the body of Christ. This is what, where Christ lives in. We need to make sure that it's clean inside and out. Um, uh, inside and out. So uh, the swine herdsmen then ran off um, when the, and, and went into town to report, report to the owners. Verse 15, uh, they came to Jesus they saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. What were they afraid of? They didn't understand change. Change in that man, okay? Here was this raving lunatic who now is in his rightful mind. How did this take place? Right? Here's this transformed man sitting at Jesus' feet. It's the same when somebody's life is changed by Jesus Christ now. And they sit there and worshiping Jesus in their rightful mind. And we say, well, we'll wait and see. Well, we should be saying, praise the Lord. Look at what he's done. He can change their hearts and change their lives. You what? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thought you were talking to me. You talk, you're talking to me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. And now, now where are the hogs? They're all dead. Dead bodies. Yep. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you didn't you didn't write that in my notes earlier, but next time you do that. Yeah, and, and so now they're they're afraid. You know, fear is their predominant emotion. Fear is driving them. Fear is in charge of them. I would say that's what twenty twenty was all about. I'd say what it's still all about. Fear, fear, fear. And when fear is rampant, what do you get? You get people speaking out in anger and violence and hatred and bitterness. And what do we see in our world today? Being controlled. Anger, violence, hatred, bitterness. Instead of what we should be giving out, the love of Jesus Christ which is greater than anything. And that's what Jesus did for this man. He, he delivered him out of these de the demons out of him because he had compassion and love on him. And that's what we should be doing for, for our fellow man, is showing them the love of Jesus. Verse 16, doubtless those who saw, and those who saw it told them how it happened, who had been demon possession about the swine. And so these, uh, you know, maybe, you know, we don't know, but maybe it, uh, it was another party of men from town coming out trying to bind the man one more time or what was going on. 
disciples are there, the testimonies are there, and they're hearing and seeing things. Verse 17. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Why would they do that? Why would they ask Jesus to leave? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, this guy's already cost us a lot of money. <laughs> you need to go out of town so you don't cause what else? Yeah, they, maybe they weren't willing to change. They didn't want to change. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> They what? Didn't want to be changed. Yep. I love darkness more than light. Yeah, it's possible, yep. Whatever it is, they recoiled from that love and that power and um, that grace and that holiness. They recoiled from it. They were afraid of it. Um, and, and we still see people that are like that today, that they are that they, they get to hear the gospel and they recoil from it. Um, and that, that's that's the human heart. God, we, we don't want you. We want we want the pigs. So go away, go away. Peter came to that point. Uh, I, I'm I'm a sinful man. Depart from me, Lord. Um, and, and and I think it's important that all of us come to that point where we say, Lord, I'm I'm not I'm not worthy of you. Um, and that that's where we come to salvation, Lord. I'm not worthy of your goodness and your grace and your love. Um, and we all need to come to that point. And then finally, we have um, consecration, verse 18 through 20. Look at verse 18. Um, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. What's he want? What's, his, what's this man who had been, de- been demon-possessed, what's he want? He wants to be with him. He wants to be close to him. Yep. It's a great thing, Right? Here it is, Jesus, you freed me. I want to be with you. Man, th- that was a different kind of prayer. Here is a prayer of a grateful heart. N- a grateful heart. This converted man wanted to be with Jesus. Look at verse 19. Jesus did not permit him. But said to him, Go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. What's he saying? Huh? That's right. Go home and be a missionary. Go to your family. Go to your friends. Go back to your hometown and tell them what has happened to you. Right? Uh, you've been a terror to everybody in town. Now go show them who you really are. Go show them what's taken place. Go show them the change. Go show them what's going on. Um, and, and go show them who I am. Live for me among nothing else but me so that when, G, when, when I do come back this way, you'll be ready to receive me and others will as well. Man, and, 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 and what, what does that say to us? We need to be missionaries right where we are. We need to start in our own homes first and foremost. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Tell them what happened. Tell them what had, took place to you. You take all of those, but you know what? What happened to you? Tell me what happened to you. Verse 20. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all that marveled. Decapolis is a loose associated with ten cities. So he doesn't just go to one city. He goes to ten c- cities and he's going to tell them about what has happened. His life has been transformed. He didn't limit his testimony to his hometown, but he carried it everywhere he went. That's what God wants us to do. Man, he has been forgiven much, and he has loved much, and we have been forgiven much, and people marveled at his testimony. Yeah. Yep. 
So again, we don't know how long he had been demon-possessed and what had taken place, but probably prior to uh, him being coming demon-possessed, he probably, he had a life, and that life probably was filled with family and friends. Yeah, good question. That's, uh, yeah. So here he is, in, for, um, he tells us that we are to, uh, we've been forgiven much, and we have been loved much, and so we should be sharing with others that we have been forgiven and loved much as well. Because why? Here's a mighty miracle that took place in this man's life. And there's, if you know Jesus as your Savior, there's a mighty miracle that's been take, that's already has taken place in your heart as well. Amen. Amen. All right, let's do our prayer request. All right. Um, I don't know if you got prayer sheets or not, but um, there should be some back there, babe. If you want to grab some, if you didn't grab one, I do have a couple I need to update you on and give you. So, um, at least can grab some. And um, Sharon Duke is having surgery May the twenty seventh, Neur- uh, neurosurgery. So remember Sharon um, as she goes through that. And then they're handing these out. Jessica, um, Jessica is Lee Martinez's daughter, if that makes sense. Okay, I didn't know her last name. Um, Jessica, the second one on there, is Lee Martinez's daughter. She is pregnant, and she has high blood pressure. She just got out of the hospital this week, so he's asked us to pray for her. Joyce Stowers. Joyce... Um, Joyce is a lady that comes to our clothing drive. She's a regular. Every time we have our clothing ministry, she's out there. Um, But she wasn't able to come this week, and her son told me because she's having liver issues and may need a liver transplant, so we want to remember her in prayer. No relation to you, is she, Tim? You don't know. Okay. Vicki McCord's neighbor's son has um, multiple sclerosis. Um, and then Barbara Kern's granddaughter, uh, Malia, we've been praying for her for a while. Uh, she's having some major surgery tomorrow. Um, uh, Barb told me that it's going to take at least 10 hours. Um, and uh, the surgery will be 10 hours. She'll be in the hospital for at least two weeks. And then home uh, refinement, uh, confinement for two months after that. So, um yeah, I'd be in prayer for her. Um, yeah. Yeah, Kirk Jordan. Yep. Sounds good. Okay. Um, yeah, I had that up here too. Um, and she said that he's on life support, so it's not good. Um, and then Lauren's still positive if she, we don't know. Continue to pray for Lauren. Um, and then, uh, Ken Swiger had his, um, heart cath. He had three, three stints put in, right? Is that what it, yeah, three stints put in. And, um, <laughs> Got a call from the doctor today, and, you know, he's been wearing that light. I, I laugh, but it's not funny. I, I feel sorry for the guy. He's been wearing that life vest, and he had to wear it for, like, 90 days. Well, because they did the heart cath, now his days start over. So he's got to wear it again until the end of July. So that's not much fun. So remember, Ken, in your prayers. Um, and then Laura Chapman is having her esophagus stretched tomorrow. Um, so be in prayer for Laura. Okay. I said share. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anything else?
Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Did she hit you when you said too much? Did she hit you when you said too much? Tell me his name again. Wayne. Praise. My, we had we'd been praying for my uncle Norm because we thought maybe they thought maybe he had a spot that was cancerous, but they found out that it wasn't. So, praise the Lord for that. Let's go ahead and pray silently then. Father, we praise you again for your goodness and your grace and your love. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for just the fact that you are all-powerful. Um, Lord, you are all-knowing. Uh, Lord, you are, you are omniscient. You, you know all things. And Father, you are in control. Uh, Lord, there are others that uh, try to usurp your power and your throne. And Satan himself is even trying that. But Lord, we know that. Um, you are too powerful, and that throne belongs to you, and you will not give it to anyone. Um, and Father, you are you are on that throne, and you are in control, and uh, we can trust you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for um, just all that you do for us, Lord. I, I, I just come before you confessing to you that we need you. We are not worthy of you, but Lord, we want to serve you and worship you because you alone are worthy. Uh, Lord, you tell us th that... Um, we should only we should have no other gods before before you, uh, Lord. You are the only one that that we can and should worship, Lord. And so I pray that we would do that, Lord, and, and that every aspect of our life would be just centered around um, worshiping you um, and worshiping you and serving you and living each moment for you, Lord. We thank you for that. We just thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. 
Uh, Father, we come before you tonight just praising you for uh, answered prayer. Uh, Father, I know that you've already answered our prayers um, and that you've already um, know what, what, uh, what each person needs, and you meet them accordingly. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for uh, Sharon as she prepares for surgery and for the doctor. And Lord, just pray that you go before her and uh, strengthen her and help them to help her with her back. And um, Lord, just to, to take the pain away. Father, we thank you for that. We pray for Ken. You continue to strengthen him and encourage him, Lord. And we thank you for that and what you're going to do in his life, Lord. For Barbara Kern's granddaughter, Malia, Lord, as she faces major surgery tomorrow, we pray for comfort and grace and uh, for the doctor to have uh, the rest that he needs and just to be in um, to be uh, prepared to do the operation and we pray for recovery time and uh, Lord for the family and that you would just encourage them through all of this Lord uh, Father we thank you for what you're doing in her life Lord we pray uh, for her cousin uh, Kirk and just pray for uh, your will to be done in um, in his life and uh, Father we thank you for uh, Jessica Lee's daughter and we pray for a healthy delivery of her child, Lord. We pray that the blood pressure would be under control, uh, Lord, and we thank you for this. We pray for uh, Viles, great, um, great grandson, Lord, and we pray for him as he uh, recovers, Lord, and that he, you would help him to g gain strength each day, um, that, they, that he'll be able to eat on his own. And uh, Father, and, and Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for your love, Lord. I thank you for um, the answers we had with uh, Ashley Jones and um, Phyllis Dean, Lord, and just uh, their physical situations that they have. We pray that you continue to bless and to encourage them. We pray, Father God, for, um, for our country, uh, Lord, that there would be a turning back to you. Uh, Father, we pray that, the, that the, Father, that there would just be an outpouring of the Spirit of God on, on your people, uh, first and foremost, and then from them to others, Lord, so that there would be just an outpouring of love and compassion and grace to each and every one, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for loving us. Uh, Father, we thank you that, uh, Lord, e even though we're not worthy, that you um, paid the ultimate price for us. And, Lord, I'm reminded that uh, the grace that you give to us is not cheap. It was costly, Lord. It cost you your son and cost, a, cost you your life. And so, Father, I pray that as we... Uh, are living to be disciples for you that we would realize that um, that grace is, is costly um, and it may cost us something but Lord it's a uh, even as, as Peter and John the disciples said what a joy it is to be able to be uh, to, to be able to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ and so Father may that be our uh, desire and uh, Father may you go before us as we serve and live each moment for you. May you be glorified. You alone are worthy, for we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, uh, a couple of pr uh, announcements. One, it's supposed to rain on Saturday, so we will not be having our men's, our work day for the pavilion. I always say men, I should just say work day, right? Um, our work day for the pavilion this week. So um, if you're planning on coming, um, if you show up, you might be all alone. Um, two is there is a prayer sheet out there uh, for our 24-hour prayer. That is next Thursday. Um, there's some slots out there. So if you have not signed up, there are 15-minute slots. We're praying for a revival. There's a prayer sheet that goes with it. Um, sign up. You can sign up for more than one. You can sign up for two, three, four, you can in an hour, or in a row, or different times or whatever. But do that. Um, three, be here Sunday morning, 1030. All right? God bless you all. Have a great week.